Well, good morning and welcome to the very last week of your senior year. I'm sorry we can't all be together. I wish we could. But um, before you go, before you get out of the x-ray department, I wanted to share one more um, presentation with you. This is something that I had worked up for the NCSRT um, meeting that did not happen. And I was going to present this, um, you know, in front of the technologists out in uh, Pinehurst, if we would have been able to, to make it out there. And the name of this presentation is Mirror, Mirror. Mirror, Mirror on the Wall. Who's the greatest radiographer of all? Okay, well, maybe I'm not the greatest radiographer of all time. But in my mind, sometimes I kind of picture myself that way. And I think everybody does to some extent. At least I know that in my class, uh, back whenever I was graduating from x-ray school, back in the class of 04, we all pretty much thought we were God's gift to the profession. Um, you know, in retrospect, kind of funny because we were just, uh, you know, barely trained and had a lot to learn. But we just didn't really know how much we had to learn. We were convinced that we pretty much had it down pat. And, you know, looking back on it, kind of funny stuff. But, um, you know, it, it's that kind of thing. Uh, it, it's one of those professions, kind of like computer science, where each person in it thinks that they're the best of the best, and everybody else is, uh, you know, just trying to catch up. So anyway, I don't know, maybe it's just me. That could just be my own hubris. Um, we're going to take a look at ourselves, um, to see ourselves as others see us. That's going to be kind of a recurring theme throughout this presentation. And I kind of don't like um, doing it this way because I can't. What I would love to do right now, if we were all in class together, I would say, okay, whoever's the greatest radiographer in here, raise your hand. And just see, you know, how many people start looking around and you know, and you know everybody wants to raise their hand. Um, but they're just waiting for somebody else to raise theirs first. Um, our objectives. Um, we're going to be taking a look at how we interact with each other um, and our patients. We're going to look at some ways that we can better serve our patients via communication. Um, we're going to also look at some changing technology. This is a big thing in radiography because we are constantly getting new image receptors. And while we're sitting here talking about it, engineers and uh, mathematicians and computer programmers are working on better ways to capture and process images because every company wants to do what? Sell their equipment, right? And the way you sell your equipment is by having a leg up on the competition some way. You know, you want to have the best equipment and you want to be able to sell it at a premium and, um, you know, bank that money and then take a vacation to Fiji and buy a new house. We're also going to look at some ways that we can improve our interpersonal communications, the way we deal with one another. And we're also going to try to learn a little bit of introspection, you know, some inward looking. By way of explanation, I know this seems like, uh, you know, kind of odd that in a radiography presentation, there would be a quote from an old Scottish poet from the 1700s. Um, but there's a reason for this. Oh, would some power the gifty gee us to see ourselves as others see us. It would from many a blunder free us in foolish notion. What airs in dress and gait would lee us and e'en devotion. Well, what he was saying here in, in his way was we don't really know how we appear to others. Um, and this is... Whenever I was a kid, we studied this poem back in, um, golly, I guess I was 14, 15 years old, something like that, um, you know, back in school. And the reason uh, he wrote this poem was he was sitting in church one day, and there was a lady sitting in front of him, and she was really dressed to the nines. Like, she's really put together, beautiful girl, um, nice clothes, um, and she's kind of... Uh, you know, one of those people that always looks sharp, right? And so he's talking about her in his poem. Um, but unbeknownst to her, she had some lice in her hair. And during the church service, those lice started crawling around 
and the people sitting behind this lady started to notice and they were kind of pointing and laughing so his point was okay here was this young lady who thought that she was all that you know she was looking good and and dressed but in reality she had lies on herself and so even though she was thinking that she was all beautiful and she probably was um what the people were seeing was that she had a, a problem with body lice. So her self-image and her outward image were not the same thing. And so Burns was saying, you know, wouldn't it be great if God, the, the one that gives us gifts, would provide us with some way of seeing ourselves through the eyes of others? And he was exactly right. You know, that would be great. Um, and so we're going to talk a little bit in this presentation about, um, you know, registering that feedback and implementing it in how we deal with others. Here's another famous quote from Gene Lee, circa 1969. Little pitchers have big ears. When you are out in public anywhere, um, you know, and especially when you're working as a technologist, keep in mind that you're going to have students around and those students um, even though they may not necessarily say anything they hear and they register a lot of the things that you say and they're they're watching you in other words when you're a technologist the students are watching you and they're taking their cues and they're trying to learn how to function in your environment so what I'm saying here is kind of be careful what you say and be careful how you act because you not only do you influence and, and have an effect on the people around you that are your peers and your patients, but you're also showing students with your words and your body language how they should act as technologists. So always keep it in mind and try to put your best foot forward as a tech um, and set a good example. Okay, so some of the stuff that I'm going to show you guys. Um, comes from my students. I've simply asked my students what uh, what they see in clinic and um, you know things that they see good and bad and it turns out that uh, for the most part the things that the students were reporting back to me anonymously was um, technical expertise and, and this is things that the students saw the technologists doing that they felt like they needed some reminding or maybe some additional um, continuing education on. Technical expertise, uh, radiation safety, the use of radiation protection. And number three was interpersonal communications. I thought that was really interesting, um, you know, to hear this from a student perspective. Okay, so part one, technical expertise. Are we really sure this is how Merrill did it? And um, keep in mind that your students, your students are trying to learn something. Um, they're looking at what you do and they're comparing that to what they're seeing in the book. And something that uh, sometimes the students will ask a technologist, and I know this from my own experience, they'll say, hey, uh, where are you centering on this? And my answer sometimes was, uh, well, you know, I'm not 100% sure about the centering point, but here's what you need to include in your image. So um, the students feel like we could use a review of our centering points and what exactly, um, what part of the anatomy are we using to landmark? Because a lot of times, at, you know, if you've been in, in radiography for more than a couple of years, you probably just sort of do a lot of things by intuition. Um, we know that there's a difference between classroom learning and clinical learning and I hate that and I'm sorry but it's just the way it is there's really no way to get around that as far as I've been able to figure out so we just have to remember um, sometimes the students are coming in and they've just been reading the books and they know the centering points really well they know what's supposed to be included um, so when they're asking questions they're typically not just trying to trip somebody up um, you know, they're just looking for some, um, like, verification or some validation of their learning. 
So when working with students, um, especially if you're a clinical instructor, we need to be able to answer their basic questions um, on the most major examinations, like where do you center for an upright abdomen, for example? Where do you center for a hip x-ray? Um, and just know, okay, well, we're going we're gonna to find the ASIS, and then we're going to go down a couple inches, and then we're going to go medial a little bit, and then right there's where we're going to be centering. And if you can, you know, you don't have to say, okay, well, it's going to be 2.4 inches inferior. It doesn't have to be super detailed. Just um, be able to answer them something. And, you know, go back and review the books if you can't remember. Um, where do we center for a PHS? Well, we're supposed to be centering at T7. And um, that works. You know, if you center at T7, then that'll take care of um, pretty much any patient. The problem is, how do you find T7? Sometimes we kind of forget that and we get kind of hung up on, okay, where's the top of the film? Um, now, where do you center for an upright abdomen? Well, two inches above the crest. So you find the patient's iliac crest and go about two inches above that. That's going to be your centering point for an upright abdomen. Um, what do most of us do? Open up the image receptor or the, the collimator to image receptor size. And then we put the top of the image receptor at the patient's armpit, and then we shoot. And most of the time it works really well. And so when you're doing that, it's kind of easy to forget exactly where that centering point was to start with. But keep in mind, we're supposed to be helping these people learn. Now, uh, to fix an x-ray. This is one that um, whenever I've been out on, and I haven't been on clinical site visit in a while for various and sundry reasons. Um, but when you're looking at an x-ray and it's either over rotated or under rotated you know how do you go about fixing that and so if you know your anatomy and i say gross anatomy because you, know, you don't necessarily have to remember every little detail but if you have the basics down then you kind of know what the human body looks like from a skeletal standpoint and it helps you figure out okay which way do i need to rotate this thing Okay, so here's a couple pictures. Um, the initial image, and by the way, this is not an amputee. This is just a phantom that I was using in the laboratory. Um, the initial image I shot, okay, this is a right knee, and I basically just threw it up against the image receptor in a sort of lateral orientation and took the image. So, of course, it's rotated. Well, how's it rotated? Okay, well, we could go and try to find that uh, medial tuberosity but uh, sometimes that's not readily apparent. But something that is ready, readily apparent, unless you've got a patient that's really jacked up, they've got a fibula. Okay, so now if they don't have a fibula, then probably all this is moot um, because they've been in a tractor accident or something. But if they do have a fibula, and here it is, we can see, oh, okay, there's way too much overlap here. What we need to do is we need to rotate the patella towards the image receptor so that this uh, fibula is swung more out and it doesn't have to be completely um, without superimposition, but there should only be a little bit of superimposition there, right? And we can see that the femoral condyles are off, you know, by a goodly margin here. Okay, so if we go over and look at, uh, this was actually my fifth attempt at making this image perfect. Yeah, even with a phantom, you know, it's not easy to get the perfect image. But what I did was I um, put a three degree cephalic angle on the tube and I rotated the patella towards the image receptor. And now I've got, look at this, those condyles are just darn near perfectly lined up um, on the posterior aspect and on the inferior aspect. I've got an open joint space here. That's where that uh, cephalic angle comes in. So on a lateral, um, you know, don't forget to put that little bit of angulation on. For most patients, that's going to work. Just because the medial condyle tends to be larger and more inferior than the lateral. And you remember that from your anatomy book. If you don't remember that, go back and take a look at it. Because it's interesting stuff. So, you know, now you know, if you see an image and you've got the fibula way, sup way superimposed, you know to rotate the patella towards the image receptor. What if the fibula was without superimposition? Well, that means that the, the knee is obliqued with the patella towards the receptor. We would just swing it back away from there. 
Um, something else that um, a couple of different students have mentioned, and here's a quote, techniques. Some techs still use high mass techniques instead of high KVP low mass because that's the way they were taught. And I know of one instance where the tech said that they would be receptive to changing the way they did things if they were shown some research. They felt that their way produced better images and that's why they weren't convinced to change. Okay, so using high mass and relatively low KVP and they're thinking that it produces a better image. And the thing is, they're not wrong. With any imaging system, as you increase the mass, you also increase a little thing called the signal to noise ratio. In other words, um, there's, uh, there's more anatomy and less noise apparent on the image. It's just one of those little quirks of digital imaging. This, this works with every system and I can prove it. Um, therefore, the temptation is really huge to bump up the mass because even though we know that we're overexposing the patient, we also know that we're not going to generate any quantum model. And the other thing is um, the SNR, the signal to noise ratio is going to be better. So our image is going to look really good. Um, and if you don't have a really firm grasp of, of the exposure indicators, you don't 100% know, okay, well, is this overexposed by a factor of half or, or a factor of two, you know, don't really know then it kind of, uh, you know, the numbers kind of go by the wayside. And it's like, okay, well, this image looks great. Let's just send it through. But is overexposing your patients in keeping with ALARA and the ARRT Code of Ethics, which, by the way, says we're not supposed to overexpose our patients. Okay, so here's a little research. Um, one image I've got here is 50 kVP at 20 mass, and it looks good. But, you know, is 20 mass good for a knee x-ray? It works. Um, so why not use it? Well, that's kind of irresponsible of us, even though I know it's just an extremity, but still, mass is mass. Over here, I've got another image. This was basically the same positioning, same collimation, using 80 kVP and 2 mass. So you can see the difference. Um, you know, did I mess up my contrast by going to 80 kVP? No, I really didn't. Now, if you get down here with a measuring device, you can tell that uh, the image on the right does have lower contrast than the image on the left. That is not readily apparent to the naked eye. You really need a computer and, you know, go pixel by pixel and figure out which image has the higher contrast you can find out that the one on the left does have higher contrast. The one on the right is perfectly serviceable. There's nothing wrong with it. 80 kVP in 2 mass. This is a diagnostic quality image. You can use this in clinic. I give you my permission. Take my research and run with it, please. Okay, some positioning. Um, this was some more quotes from students. Special, unique, or uncommon positions such as sternum, facial bones, um, cross table lateral hip, trauma humerus, trauma shoulder, etc. Um, you know, they felt like that the technologists need to go back and brush up on some of those, and we do. You know, there's a lot of things that come along. I can well remember once upon a time when I worked at New Hanover, um, we got an order in one day for a grache view of the shoulder. And everybody was, you know, kind of, we were standing around. And I hadn't even been out of school that long. I'd only been out of school for a couple of years. And I couldn't remember Grachet's shoulder to save my life. What we wound up doing was going and finding, um, ransacking, basically, uh, until we found an old copy of Merrill's. And then we got it out and started thumbing through there to find out what the Grachet was because none of us had done it in a while and we could not remember, you know, um, what angulation to put the patient, if there was an angle on the tube. Um, so we had to go back and, and quickly relearn it. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, there's no way anybody can, anybody that says they've memorized all three volumes of Merrill's is delusional. There's no way you can know all that. Um, not on a day in and day out basis. You have to go to the books once in a while and get a refresher. 
Um, just positioning in general is something else that the students felt like that uh, technologists could have a little bit more uh, training on. And trauma exams. Um, I've seen a lot of techs cause patients extreme pain by moving fractured bone when they could have gotten adequate image by using some critical thinking. I have seen this too. I've seen my coworkers either manipulate or start to manipulate bones that were obviously fractured. And their reasoning is, oh, I've got to get this into an AP orientation. That's not a good idea. I mean, yeah, of course, we all want our images to be textbook. But on a trauma patient, is that realistic? You know, it's entirely possible. And I've seen this before, too. You may have a knee x-ray where the proximal knee is, um, or I'm sorry, a tib-fib x-ray, where the proximal part of the tib-fib is in AP orientation, and the ankle and foot are in a lateral orientation because the bones are transected and the, and the limb is twisted. Is it a good idea to try to take the patient's ankle and twist it back into an AP? No, no, no. You can't do that. Um, if you try to start moving patients around that are traumatized, you could really hurt them. And could it be possible that the patient is sandbagging, looking for drugs? Absolutely. But we're not doctors. That's not our call. We have to treat the patient as though they really are injured, even though we, in, our, in the back of our mind, we may think, oh, okay, well, they're just faking it. They may be, but they may not. So don't take the chance. Don't mess around with limbs or organs that you suspect might be damaged. You could wind up doing a lot more harm than good. Um, okay, so a little bit of a work in progress. Why are we so resistant to change? Well, some people seem completely incapable of admitting to an error. Um, even when they're shown the right way to do something, they still resist, even in the face of peer-reviewed documentation. Now, in case you don't know, peer-reviewed studies are those that have been done. This is where people have gone out and they've, um, they've done some research. They've examined some patients. They've been to some emergency rooms. They've seen how things are done. They've gone back and written a paper about it. And then they've handed that paper over for review. So people have gone through there, people that know what they're doing have gone through that paper and made sure that it's real, that the, the research is legit, the citations are legit. This thing is, is fact. This, this isn't just somebody's opinion. This is real information on how to do things. Um, and even if you show people that, they still won't believe it sometimes, which to me is just unfathomable. But I've seen it over and over again. Here's another quote that I really like. I got into an argument with a technologist regarding proper positioning for an exam and was told, quote, I've been doing this for 20 years and I know what I'm doing. The tech was insisting that upper rib x-rays were done on expiration at a 72-inch SID. After showing the tech it was wrong in the book, I was told they must have changed it and they continued to do it wrong. Maybe intervention by another technologist might fix it, but they seemed set in their ways. What can you do? If you take a textbook, especially one as revered as Merrill's or Bontrager's, I mean, these are the textbooks for radiography positioning. And if somebody looks at the Bontrager book and denies that what's in it is accurate, um, I'm not really sure what to do for somebody like that. Um, they're probably certainly not going to listen to Jonathan Lee. This is one of my favorite stories and, you know, kind of amusing. This happened back in 1995. A man named MacArthur Wheeler robbed two banks in the same day after first rubbing his face liberally with lemon juice. 
he went to the store and got some lemons and he uh, you know cut them up and rubbed the lemon juice all over his face and then he went out and he robbed these banks in broad daylight um, you know of course he got caught you know the the police showed up at his doorstep like that afternoon because they um, you know they asked witnesses they ran his they had him all on videotape you know he he made no effort to hide himself and so they they went to his apartment and knocked on the door and and there he was counting his loot you know so they cuffed him up and took him off to jail well this made the news and a couple of psychological researchers uh david dunning and justin kruger they thought this was the darndest thing they'd ever heard of and they felt like that they needed to explain this behavior oh by the way uh, the lemon juice this guy uh, macarthur wheeler he was completely surprised when the police show up at his house he thought he got away scot-free and when they asked him you know about what he had done he said that since you could make invisible ink out of lemon juice it stood to reason that putting lemon juice on your face would make you invisible to all cameras and he wasn't joking uh, he really believed it and you know even when they showed him the video evidence he thought it must be doctored somehow because his face was covered with lemon juice and therefore he couldn't have possibly appeared on um, any camera so they were like okay well whatever psycho and they send him off to jail but these researchers thought okay this is worthy of research why would a man you know even when shown a video of himself still believe that his way of thinking was correct um, they made some discoveries they discovered that people um, all people tend to overestimate their own skills remember all that stuff I was talking about being the king of x-ray well yeah you know, I overestimate my own skill, but I'm aware of that. You know, I'm just kind of kidding around. Um, and But here's another example. If you poll drivers, I'll bet if I were to ask people in the classroom, okay, who here is a good driver? The majority of the classroom would raise their hand. Now, this is mathematically impossible. More than 50% of drivers can't be above average. And the fact that 88% of drivers, that's almost 90%, rate themselves as above average means that a lot of people have um, you know uh, an inflated idea of their own capabilities and they studied this and it actually has a name now the Dunning-Kruger effect okay so in order to overcome the Dunning-Kruger effect what can we do well keep in mind that it exists and that most of us are um, subject to it ask people for feedback you know ask your supervisor ask your peers you know how do you guys think i'm doing um you know is is my communication okay how do i come across because sometimes we come across as being hostile or something and we totally don't mean it you know um maybe we just uh had a bad time with our kids that morning or or our spouse was not being very nice to us whenever we were getting ready for work we or you had a bad time trying to drive to work you know some moron darn near killed you in traffic um you know which happens more often than than we think um because of the 88 percent of people that think that they're great drivers but aren't um always keep yourself open to learning try to learn something new every day that's kind of like um one of my things you know um whenever i get to the end of the day can i look back on the day and say hey you know i learned something new today and keep in mind also that in radiography there's no such thing as too much information um the more you know the better you're going to be as an x-ray technologist and later studies in the dunning kruger effect revealed that and i thought this was really interesting people that are poor performers do not understand that they need to improve even if somebody approaches them and tells them about it you know so if uh, if somebody is thinking that they're the greatest and they're not and then their supervisor comes to them and says hey you know you need to improve the way you do this you're having way too many repeats instead of acknowledging that they need to learn 
they start grasping for excuses. Um, and sometimes the excuses are valid. You know, like if you've got a bunch of patients that day that are, um, you know, they're half dead, they can't stand up, they're constantly about to fall over, um, you know, you're having to hold them up to do it, even the simplest x-ray, you know, of course your images aren't going to look spectacular because, um, you know, you can't make a silk purse out of a sow's ear. But, um, you know, barring that, you know, if you've got a bunch of patients that are walkie-talkie and you're still cutting off the apices on a regular basis, well, that's something that can be addressed. You know, maybe you can be coached a little bit and improve your centering and, and improve your collimation and start making less repeats. But a lot of times people, what is it, people that are incompetent are so incompetent that they can't recognize their own incompetence. And people like that are extremely tough to deal with because they don't want to improve. As far as they're concerned, they're doing fine. So just be aware of this and always keep it, keep it in mind and watch for this behavior in yourself. You know, you, even if you're not saying anything to anybody else, you can kind of, you know, and I sometimes I laugh to myself. I'm like, okay, you know, maybe I'm not all that. But I'm getting better. Um, okay, the next part of this, uh, and I've kind of skipped part, but like I said, this presentation is a work in progress. But I wanted to get on with the interpersonal communications um, because this is really important. Very important, it turns out. Okay, so let me tell you my story. Here's a story from the King of X-Ray. Uh, okay, so there I was working at New Hanover, and I'd been working at New Hanover for like a couple of months, and I was doing such good work. You know, I was doing everything. I was going over to the OR. I was going out on portables. Um, you know, I was taking care of patients in the department. Uh, I was working in the ED. I was all over the place, and I was just like, you know, I was having fun, but I was working my job. You know, I was doing my thing. Well. One day, uh, you know, my Lightroom supervisor, day shift supervisor comes to me and she says, hey, uh, John, Ed needs to see you in his office um, at 11 o'clock. And I was like, oh, okay, cool, no problem. So, you know, because I like Ed. He's really, he was one of the best bosses I ever worked for. So I'm thinking to myself, you know, all morning as I'm working, you know, I'm like taking patients and doing my stuff. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, man, you know, I'm in line for a big promotion. He's probably going to offer me, like, second shift supervisor. So, no lie. I'm thinking, like, like I'm going into, into Ed's office, and I'm coming out with a promotion. Okay, so I go to Ed's office. And he's like, look, you know, this is about perception, and this is not necessarily all based in fact, he said, I know how you work. I've seen you work, you know, for a while now. And he said, but this is how you're coming across to your coworkers. And then he had like this big old list of all of my transgressions. It was like a detailed list of everything I'd done since I got there that could be possibly construed as something negative. And I was just like, oh my gosh, you know, I had no idea that my coworkers thought that I was such a slacker, you know, and I can't remember exactly everything that was on the, the list of JL's transgressions, um, you know, but it was a, it was very eye opening. I was like, holy Mac, I had no clue that I was perceived in that way, you know, like I'm trying to avoid work, right? Like by 10 o'clock in the morning, I'm broke out in a sweat every day. You know, I'm, I'm, I thought I was working hard, but apparently I wasn't working hard enough for my coworkers' satisfaction. So I was like, okay, you know, I, I need this job, right? I can't walk away from this. I've got to figure out how to get along with my coworkers. So I was just like, all right, um, you know, I'm just going to start doing pretty much every exam that comes down the line. Um, grabbing, I'm going to grab charts as they hit, and I'm just going to basically try to hustle to where my coworkers can kind of sit back and relax, and I'll do the bulk of the work. 
And of course, I didn't say anything to anybody. I just did this. You know, I just, I was working hard already, but now I really got on the ball and I just started doing everything. And eventually I moved to the shift that I wanted, which was 5.30 to 2, and, and I was almost exclusively on OR and portables. But it was kind of funny. I was, uh, even though I was technically on OR and portables, I was getting pulled back to the floor constantly. And I'm not sure if that's because the supervisor just, um, you know, was wanting to beat me to death, or if I was considered as too valuable of an asset to be completely let go from my floor duties. I don't know. I just noticed that I was the only one that, you know, seemed, seemed like I got to do everything that needed to be done. Anyways, um, yeah, so that's my story. My, my self-perception was way different than what other people were seeing. So I had to get my mind around that, but I did. And it, you know, it improved me. It helped me be a better tech. So why was I surprised, you know, whenever I got pulled into the office and I didn't get promoted? Um, well, I knew that the environment I was in was pretty judgmental um, and at that time was kind of clicky. I mean, it's not that way so much anymore. But, you know, remember, this was quite a few years ago. I thought I was doing a good job. None of my coworkers ever said anything on a day to day basis. And I thought that I was working um, at least as hard as everybody else. And uh, unfortunately, my coworkers saw things much differently. You know, and could this have been handled better? Well, absolutely. You know, I'm not some kind of an ogre that you can't approach. If any of my coworkers have a problem with what I'm doing, then I would love for them to approach me and, and let me know. You know, so why didn't my coworkers come to me directly? And, you know, I wish we were in class because I would love to use this as a raise your hand time. You know, why would somebody, why would somebody go to my boss instead of just coming to me and saying, hey, you know, you're nothing but a slacker. Why don't you get on the ball? Well, because that takes guts and a lot of people don't have guts. It's much easier to go, um, you know, go tell the boss or, you know, uh, gossip, that kind of stuff, than it is to go directly to somebody and say, hey, I've got a problem with the way you're doing things. So a little introspective exercise I want you to think about. Do you have what it takes? Do you have the intestinal fortitude to go to one of your coworkers and say, hey, you know, do you mind if I talk to you privately for just a minute? And, and then let them know, voice your concern. At least give them a chance to fix things before you go blab into uh, senior management. You know, don't try to get the guy fired before he's had a chance to improve himself. Okay, and as long as I'm telling stories about myself, uh, this was another thing that I thought was, it was kind of funny, but at the time it was just like an oh my gosh moment. Um, I was doing a series of interviews with my students, and this was basically um, just some short videos, and I was asking my students to give one or two little piece of, pieces of advice to prospective radiography students, and I was wanting to have something that I could use um, in the context of a radiography information session. Um, so asking them for some words of advice. Now, on this video was just my students. I wasn't on the video, but my voice was, and I could hear myself from behind the camera. And I did not know that I came across as such a smart aleck. I was like, oh my gosh, you know, I'm, I'm like, I'm probably hurting people's feelings. So, you know, after watching the video and listening to my own voice, um, the next time I went to that classroom, the first thing I did was just apologize to the entire class. And, you know, I was like, oh my gosh, y'all, I am so sorry. I did not realize that I came across that way and I'm going to really try to do better and, and please forgive me because I don't mean any insult. They were very good natured about it. You know, my students, they were like, oh yeah, you know, well, you do that, but it's just the way you are, and, and sometimes it's kind of funny. I was like, okay, you know, I'm going to try to get better. And please understand, if I come across as being a smart aleck, 
I, I probably am trying to be funny. Um, it's just my way, and I certainly don't mean to be insulting anybody. So please forgive me. All right, well, what about you? Um, are you willing to speak openly to your colleagues and let them know if they're doing things like, okay, if somebody's taking like excessively long breaks, like they're just disappearing from the department, then just let them know, you know, hey, man, um, you were gone for 25 minutes and I, I really could have used your help. Um, you know, it, it could be that they don't... A lot of times I do this, you know, like I would go down the hall to get some coffee or something like that, and I would wind up chatting with people from another department. And so instead of being gone for five minutes, I'm gone for 30 minutes. And uh, yeah, you know, that's the kind of thing you have to work on. Um, what are some obstacles to our communications? Well, sometimes we're hesitant to say anything because, you know, we don't want the person to get their feelings hurt. We don't want them to retaliate. Um, and retaliation can take a lot of forms. You know, they might make up stuff about us and go tell our supervisor, or we might just wind up getting talked about at the water cooler. You know, they can, um, maybe we become the um, subject of office gossip. But how can we overcome these and build a more positive and productive work environment? And I pose these as questions, not as statements because I'm open to suggestions. I really want to have a good relationship, a good working relationship with my coworkers, and I'm always trying to improve that. You know, I, I want to, I want to listen to them, and I want to give their ideas credence, even though, you know, sometimes they come up with stuff that I don't necessarily agree with, or I don't even understand, you know, why they're doing what they're doing. And, um, Usually what I'll do is just kind of go along with it and and just kind of let it play out and see what happens because I'm not perfect by any means. And sometimes uh, people will come up with an idea and I'm thinking to myself, ah, that'll never work. But then it does, you know, so it turns out I was wrong. So, yeah, I've kind of learned to uh, to kind of go along with folks and, and just see what happens. And sometimes people's ideas work out and sometimes they don't. Um, but either way, I try to be supportive, always. And, you know, last but not least, introspection. Um, what is introspection? Well, it literally means inward looking. Um, if I'm looking at myself, you know, what are things that I can do to improve? And how do I know that I need to improve? Well, Luckily, I just happen to be a teacher with a group of students that are captive, and so I ask them every year, you know, what did you like about the class? What did you not like about the class? And how can I improve things for next year? And as a matter of fact, that's going to be part of our discussion post for this week. I'm going to ask you to do a little introspection about yourself, and I'm going to ask you to help me, you know. Um, let me know what could I have done to help make your education better. And I'm always open to suggestions, you know. And if you suggest something, you know, maybe I'll try it and, and see how it works. And then next year I'll ask that group of students, you know, what here's some changes that I made or here's what we did this semester, uh, what worked and what didn't. And keep in mind, um, the thing about introspection is it's not easy for everyone. Some people just seem uh, basically incapable of uh, recognizing that they need to improve. Um, and other people, their personality or their, uh, their sense of self-worth, I suppose I should say, their sense of self-worth is tied up in their job performance. So if somebody disparages their performance, they consider that as a, you know, slap to the face. You know, they're, they're saying, or they take it as, okay, if you're, if you're impugning my performance, then that means you're attacking me directly um, as a person. That's not it, you know. And how do you take, um, how do you take a person like that and help them improve? 
it's hard and it might not even be possible. There are some folks that are so resistant to change that they cannot be taught. It's like what they learned 20 years ago in x-ray school is all the knowledge that they're ever going to get and they just don't, they, they can't, they can't learn, they can't improve. Luckily, those kind of people are fairly rare. Most people in our profession, especially the ones that have come through school in the last 15 years or so, they tend to be a little more flexible and a little more open to learning because they're aware that we're in an environment that changes. You know, we're all the time getting new computer systems. We're always getting new image receptor systems. Um, you know, things change. You have to be able to change with it. Um, and for some people, uh, you know, admitting a mistake, that just hurts their pride too much. You know, they, they just can't admit that they did something wrong. Now, here's the thing about people that are very, very proud. Can they admit their mistake? Maybe not. But that doesn't mean that they're stupid and they can't learn from it. They might not be able to admit to you that they were wrong, but in their mind, they know it and they might go off and, and make improvements on their own. So, you know, like you, you might suggest to somebody, well, you know, you should be looking for that exposure index to be down around 350 instead of 700. And they'll be like, ah, shut up. I know what I'm doing. But then later on, you work with them again and you notice that now their exposure index is down around four, 400, 375. It's like, okay, you know, you told me I was full of junk, but now I see that you're, um, you're adopting what I said. Okay, don't say anything, no gloating, um, you know, just be thankful that your words had an impact. Um, because they do, words are powerful. And even if somebody might not acknowledge it today, you've planted the seed, you know, you've made them think. And people that have high intelligence, relatively high intelligence, are open to change. You know, they're always looking for better ways to do things. It just goes with the turf. Now, what about me? What about us? Um, are we open to constructive criticism? I hope so. Because, you know, whenever I tell you, okay, well, you should be doing this or you should be doing that, it's not that I'm trying to make fun of you or anything. It's that I'm trying to help you get better. I want you to be the best technologist possible. Because, okay, part of this is self-serving. Because I want people to say, hey, you know, that... Uh, that class of 2020, man, those guys were so on the ball. And whenever I hear that kind of thing, I'm, you know, of course that makes me feel good because I can't help but think that, you know, I had at least a little bit of something to do with it. Now, um, a little bit more about this. If, uh, if you make a mistake, will you get in trouble with management if you admit it, if you own your mistake? Will a mistake bring you under scrutiny? You know, will, uh, will people be ranking on you for making a mistake? Well, possibly. I've had coworkers before that if you made a mistake, they would uh, make fun of you the whole rest of the day, um, you know, over something you did. It's all right. You know, they're, that's just their way. Um, and they weren't like trying to get me fired or anything like that. They were just having a little good natured fun at my expense. I don't mind because I know that next week they're going to make some goofy mistake and then it's going to be my turn to rank them out. Um, here's something that might be surprising to you. If you know that you made a mistake, then probably so does everybody else, even if they haven't said anything. So, you know, don't be thinking that, you know, because you repeated a C-spine five times, you know, trying to get the odontoid on there, you know, somebody's probably noticing. They're pulling up your images whenever you're not around and and looking at them because I know I've been a technologist we do that so why not just own your mistakes um, you know just let people know shoot that patient was in there and they you know every time I try to get them positioned they move you know it kept twisting and looking and it took me forever to get that you know we understand you know we all make mistakes some of us just pretend like we're perfect so in conclusion um, this has been about a 50 minute presentation already. None of us are perfect um, and we're not going to be. But as you're going into your career and you're helping students because you're getting ready to be the tech, um, next week some of you are sitting for the registry. 
and you're going to be the technologist later this summer and in the fall that the students are going to be coming to and they're going to be asking you for advice. Um, you know, just try really hard to listen to yourself as you're talking. You know, try not to talk down to people. Try not to be a smart aleck. You know, don't do what I've done. Um, you know, try to be better than me. Uh, keep in mind, you know, how you come across and how do you want to be perceived? You know, do you want people to, you know, think that you're a mean person? Or do you want people to think that you're somebody that's a team player that they can be free to approach? That's what I want. I want people to be able to come to me and say, hey, uh, JL, um, I've got this patient and I just can't seem to get them in position. Can you come help me? Um, yeah, absolutely. You know, hey, can you come take a look at this image and let me know if you think everything's on there or not? Because, you know, we all do that. I'm like, oh, man, are the apices on? Is the costophrenic angle on there? Um, I'm not 100% sure. You know, hey, Shelly, could you come look at this? Um, that's part of our cooperation as technologists, you know, working together. Um, keep in mind also, the walls have ears. Don't say anything in the exam room that you wouldn't say out loud in the light room. Because, you know, you might not necessarily know. Somebody could be outside the door listening to you talk. Somebody could be walking into the control booth while you're not paying attention. And they hear everything that happens between you and your patient or between you and your coworker. So keep in mind, um, you know, watch your tongue. Uh, don't use a bunch of profanity. You never know if uh, there could be a patient in the bathroom and you're out there cussing a blue streak. Well, you know, some patients don't really like that. You know, I'm, I don't want to hear it for sure. Um, and it can undermine your own uh, professionalism if you do that kind of stuff. And don't ever be afraid to say, hey, you know, that is a, that was a jacked up image. I did that. I'm going to go repeat it. I'm going to make it better, you know, or I said something I shouldn't have. I'm sorry that I offended folks and I apologize. You know, never be too big to to admit your mistake and apologize. And people are open to that. I've never, ever gotten in trouble on a job for going to my boss and saying, hey, you know, I messed something up. Um, and I just want to make sure that that doesn't come down on anybody else but me because that was totally my fault. Rachel had nothing to do with it. Um, that's the kind of thing that builds you a good reputation as a coworker and an employee, and people will trust you if they know that you're willing to, you know, take the fall for your own mistakes and help them whenever needed. So I guess, you know, as you're going into your career, um, good luck. I'm really, really looking forward to working with some of y'all in clinic. Um, I'm going to come around in the fall, definitely, on uh, clinical site visits. And I'm going to be checking on you to make sure that you're doing right by my students. All right, so um, thanks very much for your kind attention. I'm sorry the back half of the semester wound up being kind of jacked up, um, but I, I feel like that we've made the most of it under trying circumstances. And we weren't able to do all of our um, lab practicals. Um, but let me just tell you, the, the people that did do lab practicals, y'all did a really good job. Um, we were, Ms. Berger and I were very impressed by your abilities, uh, your abilities to think outside the box. And I really appreciated that some of y'all, um, you know, came up with ideas uh, of things that you wanted to try in the laboratory just to see if it worked or, you know, see what happened. And when you come up with good ideas, you know, that starts me thinking and we kind of feed off of one another. So, um, Thanks very much for that. Um, Y'all have been wonderful. And I'm hoping that, um, you know, this won't be the last time we see each other. And yeah, y'all have a good summer and good luck in your career. All right, take care and thanks again for everything.